now more than ever, people need to go within and plug into that cellular memory, plug into the divine source, detach as much as possible from the matrix. A lot of these people that have all these abilities, who have celestial star ancestry, they're operating not only throughout this cosmos, but in higher planes, and they're working against the Draco Empire. Photonic energy and the cosmic rays will activate our higher centers. And it's incumbent upon us to ride that frequency wave. Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, my two very special guests are Naomi Swan and Deborah Jane East, both of whom are very dear friends of mine, mentors, teachers, and have a lot to share today. Today is a very special show, and I'm really excited to share this with you, my dear listeners. Naomi Swan is an adept at inner remote viewing. She is a door opener to the quantum world. She gives you the clarity and inner insight to shift into an organic field of pure energy. Naomi is diverse at removing implants, sexual vampirism, interdimensional entities, and accumulated emotions. Her laser-sharp intelligence decodes, reprograms, reframes past time loops, and dissolves inorganic matter through multi-level dimensions and timelines. Naomi has the capability to discover hidden messages in past lives and inner child wounds operating in the background is inner freedom. Her heightened inner discernment gives clarity by educating the client by informing inorganic attachments, tithers, projections, and lower occult trickster energy that artificial intelligence works with. She is known as a bug zapper. You will leave feeling sustained, calm, and have a deep connection to divine intelligence. And let me read you an endorsement from one of her many clients who have benefited greatly from Naomi Swan's healing and work. Quote, Naomi teaches you how to heal yourself, and she goes very deep. I lost my daughter this year, and Naomi has helped me heal through the hardest, most unbearable time in my life. She has been with me through the entire ordeal. She has a beautiful, pure heart that is truly filled with love. You know how you feel completely shattered into pieces that you think you will never be able to put back together? I have put most of the pieces back together stronger than ever, and I plan to continue on that path. I recommend her to anyone who has been thinking about having a session with her. End quote. Naomi Swan is a dear friend of mine, and she has healed me. She has helped me. She has a unique way of tuning into me at almost any time, and I, I give her permission to tune into me at any time because she's a dear friend of mine, and I trust her implicitly. Uh, Naomi Swan's website is embodyenergeticecstasy.com. Our other guest today is Deborah Jane East. Deborah Jane East grew up in a rural town in Virginia, and from an early age, she had an interest in writing, astronomy, and science. In 1968, close to midnight, her family went outside to see what their German Shepherd dog was barking at. Looming over the hill, a lens-shaped object the size of a tractor trailer with a rotating band of blue, white, and red lights hovered silently in the moonlight. That was the first UFO sighting she experienced at 12 years of age. That was only the beginning of the family's sightings, with the most significant one happening in 1987 after a large UFO flap in Wytheville, Virginia. After hundreds of sightings by military, the sheriff's departments, and many locals, including radio newscaster Danny Gordon, her parents woke up to find a strange triangle-shaped landing mark in their back field. After her career and raising a family, Miss East returned to her first love and began writing paranormal books and also researching the UFO phenomenon. This led to her hosting her own radio show six years ago, and she is still giving people a voice to tell their stories today. 
and I am one of many people that Deborah Jane East had interviewed. I was on her fine shows in the past, and those shows that I did with her uh, were instant classics, in my humble opinion, because we got a lot of great information out. Deborah, likewise, is a dear friend of mine, and I'm just so thankful and blessed to have Deborah and Naomi in my life. Deborah's websites are notes from the underground dot blogspot dot com dot au and her radio program is called starlight seventeen and so without any further ado here are naomi swan and deborah jane east i just want to say james it is wonderful to be with you and naomi because it wasn't so long ago that you sent me a message and you said i have this really switched on gal that I want you to meet, and she is just so above board, and everything she says is right on the money. You just have to meet her. And little did I know that you were introducing to me one of my best friends in the whole world. She is not only my mentor, she is a, a good friend. She guides me. She has so much insight. I don't think that I would be where I'm at today if if you hadn't have introduced us, because as you know, we are in a field of chaos, and any help we can get is so welcome. So I am thrilled to be on the show with both of you guys. And I am, too. It's been way too long. We've been trying to get these shows together, and with all the chaos going on, I'm just glad that we finally had the time to put it together so that we can get on with clearing up some of this energy that is not beneficial in our field and come to our true selves. And I feel so fortunate to be able to do it with you, you James, and you, Deborah. And to be seen on this level, I cannot tell you that you both see me at is, an, is a freedom that I can't even share what this means to me. I feel so honored and respected. Thank you. When we do this kind of work, we know that we're going to receive some degree of resistance because that's the nature of this matrix world. And what we're trying to do is bring clarity, harmony, and understanding and healing into the mix because a lot of people out there are crying for for understanding and they want help in healing and that's what we're all about here at the Cosmic Switchboard Show. And uh, Naomi, you had a lot of information to share with us, but before we really get started, just tell us a bit about what you've been doing uh, since we last had you on the show. Well, I had to take a break because I was so heavily targeted um, after the show. I mean, really just kind of go down deep and get really anchored and centered and find out what the tricksters are out there doing. And I think that because of my choice and I want inner freedom so bad that I get these workshops all the time in my space. So what I do is I write on them. And so I'm doing blogs and I'm being told from my higher self that they are like, you know, prescriptions for energy transmission. So not only will I be doing the blogs, and then of course I want to continue to do the show with you because I think that we need it on, on all angles as much as possible. And so that's what I've been doing and I, you know, I have a bunch of blogs ready to go. So when we're ready to do the show, I'm, I'm here for you when you're ready. Definitely, we need to get all that information out. And it's very timely and it's very synchronistic, Naomi and Deborah, that we would have this show. Because uh, just last week, I had George Cavasilis on. And he talked a lot about the critical importance of the heart, the physical heart, and the heart intelligence. And it was something that I came across working with my German friends uh, some time ago. We used to do these Skype sessions until, sadly, uh, my, my dear German friend Martina was so attacked by the Draco that she had to basically retire from the field. But she taught me the value of tuning into your heart center. It was something I was intuitively doing, but not realizing I was doing, if, if you know what I mean. But what uh, Martina used to do was when she would put out a question during these Skype sessions I had with my German friends, she and another gal in particular, Franya, they would both chime in, yes, the answer is yes. You know, we're getting that, that, that tingly feeling, uh, you know, suggesting a yes answer in her, heart, in her heart area, right, her heart center. And so I thought about that, and, and then it registered to me at that point what was going on, because I know in my own personal experience, when I felt bad energy, when I got a definite no-no answer, I would feel this discordance in my heart center. It never occurred to me, because sometimes it takes a while for the coin to drop, ladies, that the opposite of that would also uh, hold true, that you can get a positive, meaningful, 
yes answer through the heart intelligence. And I know it's a lot more complex than that. There's a lot more to it. So, uh, so please, I, I'd like to know from your perspective, ladies, starting with you, Naomi, what do you mean by absolute knowingness through the heart intelligence? Well, I think where we're at in this type, this day and time, James, is this absolute knowingness, is this inner trust that we that we're developing, and how we develop it is um, having empathy of the pain and suffering, not only of our own misery first, because then we heal thyself first, and then we can empathize with others, and when we can hold that heart space for others, is when that's the next level of the heart opening, and the intelligence is there to help and support us. Then what happens, I see, is um, the perceptions are cleared. It's not shattered anymore. You have more of a clarity, and I, that's, the, that's the crystal organic grid that we're, we're going to. And then I also feel, too, that for me, what I've noticed in the last, you know, 15, 20 years is this deep, profound connection to Mother Earth, and she supports us. There's like grace all the time in my field. It's like grace is just surrounding me continuously. And my heart becomes my compass. It's my inner guidance. And there's like no map needed. It's just present moment organic frequencies. And it's fueled with safety. So to me, that's how I know I'm in my heart intelligence all the time. When I'm, you know, when I'm not in body and I'm in a hurry and I'm crazy or whatever, I jump out. And then something will happen on the outside to show me, wait a minute, you're not in line with your intelligence, get back in. So I really, I really, really appreciate the universe showing me when I'm out of alignment because sometimes we have our own blind spots and then the heart intelligence is there. And once we open that up and really clear, clear the space of the heart intelligence, that's the magic. And as we know, and I'm going to let Deborah come in on this, as we know though, the, the tricksters are to cover up the heart because as long as they can cover up the heart, they can go after the first three chakras. And I, I heard George's show with you, and it's very good. I agree with him. In fact, I taught a show similar to this. I'm, I just have a couple of different flares, but they're still kind of the same thing. So they'll go after the first three chakras, and then people are driving on those wounds of the th- first three chakras, and there's no heart intelligence. It's only mechanical. And so that's what I know by seeing the, the difference in the two. What's your take, Deborah? Well, I just have to say this. James mentioned something that I think is extremely important, and that is synchronicity. I find when researchers such as ourselves, when we work together as a collective, our message is stronger, more powerful, and they seem to have a harder time taking it down when there is a group of us. And if you think about it, divide and conquer yeah that's that's what they do if you've read the art of war if they can get you by yourself they are able to tear down a lot of times things that you do but their strength in joining together with other researchers that are like-minded and the universe will speak to you i love what you say on your blog naomi about looking to mother nature about um and using examples of of what they do and how they have strength and how they fall. Because a lot of times, this chaos, it, it goes off on a tangent and large groups of people are affected and, and the fear keeps your heart from knowing the truth. Fear is a big blocker for heart intelligence. When we can clear that out of the way, I tell you what, there is nothing like being synchronized with someone and being able to see on their level. And I have experienced that with Naomi uh, a lot. Uh, we'll be talking about something and then we'll both get some confirmation about it at the same time. I'm talking about in our heart, in our body, just hours later sometimes. Something will come into my field, an article or a YouTube video. I mean, we've seen this dozens of times, haven't we, Naomi? We sort of expect it now. And that is what I like about her blog and her explanation of this is, you know, our heart intelligence, it's our own truth serum. It's our own truth serum if we'll just learn how to see and listen to the keys. From a micro perspective, too, and it's not really an apt description because I'm talking about our totality of ourselves, of our physical body, our energetic body, 
our mental body, what they strive to do is kind of disengage us, to fragment us within. We go through decades worth of of a shame-based life where from an early age we're hammered with imposed guilt, imposed shame, whether it's from religions, whether it's from narcissistic people, especially it's even worse if it's in your own family, and you begin not to trust yourself. You begin not to trust your inner guidance because we're shame-based. We're taught that we're we're dumb and we're stupid and, and we're full of shame. And so, and this is another reason why, on an outward level, so many people resort to self-medication, alcoholism, uh, etc., because thoughts lead to feelings. And a lot of these people that have these recurring thoughts of the negative variety of these OCD thought loops, that engenders negative feelings, and they want to avoid that at all costs. Hence the self-medication or the indulgence in a variety of self-sabotaging behaviors, because when we stay in the heart center, we stay in our own truth. But when the manipulation and the external harassment kicks in, and I'd like your thoughts on this, ladies, it's almost designed to get us out of our heart center and get out, get us out of our inner harmony and get us back into our headspace. In our headspace, it's almost like we're in their playground again. We're, we become disembodied again, and they can start feeding in the OCD thought loops. They can start feeding in the thought loops of despair, of hopelessness, etc. Well, what are your thoughts on that? Well, for me, if that happens for me, what I've learned again, and I, you know, I call it the energy muscle, and it's an opportunity to change the neural pathways and the false patterning so that we change the, our perceptions back to, you know, divine alignment is what, I'm, is what I call it. And we need to be in divine alignment to understand it. But again, I always say it's high insight. Sometimes we have to go through you know, the experience to go back and get the high insight and pick up the nugget. And then we know that the universe or another setup will come in because, you know, they're always ready for another feed. So we can use it to their advantage or our advantage. And so when we can use it to our advantage is we're also playing on their their synergy because it's all about intention and it's all about breaking the inorganic habit. But we can take that dark synergy that they're playing with and we can wrap, we can turn it around and create this energy to come into us and make it organic by being in integrity, you know, authenticity and treating other people basically how you want to be treated, you know. And so I think that that is how, to me, how we regulate the heart intelligence and, and keeping us in a line. And as we bo- as we all know, you know, it's, it's every single minute of every day we have to be in constant aware- awareness anymore. Because they will plug in or come in one way or the other. But the cool part about it, what's that doing for us? It's taking us deeper into the heart and into Mother, our true home. What's your take, Deb? I think this is very important. I think we need to learn also to trust our bodies, to trust. You know, whenever you hear something that sounds off, we have sort of a little bit of adrenaline you know, uh, rush in our body if something is alarming to us. And uh, you may hear something and you say, oh, gosh, that doesn't sound right. But you notice a difference in your body and the way that your mind is functioning. You start trying to think, does this sound right to me? But when you hear truth, it's like your body confirms that. You have your emotional outlook is much calmer and you just feel like a peace with it. I think in this day and time when there's so much artificial stuff going on that mask our feelings, our emotions, you know, you drink, say you drink 25 cups of coffee a day or or you smoke cigarettes or you're on a lot of pharmaceuticals for different kinds of illnesses, I think we've polluted our bodies to the point where a lot of people don't trust themselves or trust their thoughts. So I think getting back in touch with the basics and learning to love ourselves is a big key element in being able to discern some of these things that are going on. One of the things I've noticed is that when we're kind of shunted out of our center, out of our inner harmony, we need to recognize the source of that. Now, what the Demiurge has done, as you know, ladies, it's created this artificial intelligence that just constantly adds on in a Borg-like fashion. It's constantly learning 
Uh, it's got this ongoing algorithmic process where it learns patterns, it learns tendencies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that's the fake, inorganic element. We already have an innate version, organic version of that. Oh, so when that person over there, who I don't even know, and who gives off a certain energy field, started making certain comments, it triggered this emotional and physical reaction within me. Okay, learn that, been there, done that, and I can move on. And, and then what happens is, what I've learned over time is, that goes into my memory banks, that goes into my body's memory banks. So, and again, it goes back to what we talked about earlier. Sometimes we're so shame-based, and it takes so long to slew off the layers and layers of shame-based programming, and we become mistrustful of what our own body, what our own heart center tells us. So as time goes on, as we begin to see these triggers around us, we begin to form a database, if you will, in our body, in our heart center, of the things that are not true to us, that have an incongruence and a discordance with us. And so we need to get back to that point where we need to start trusting ourselves, recognize the nature of the reality we're in, that there's even going to be well-meaning, essentially heart-centered people, but because of whatever kind of challenges they're going through, whatever unresolved issues that they're still going through, that it may have an impact on us. Did, did any of you want to comment on that? I also just want to bring a point, too, to you, James and Deborah, what you're talking about. I think, too, there's a misconception, and I want to bring this to, to truth, too, because it's confusing. It's very confusing. You know, a, a lot of the people will say, you know, change your perception. It's a miracle. And sometimes when you're in the shattered, what I'll call reality or trauma reality, and you're just hijacked, you can't change your perception. You're stuck. You're like, whoa, you know, what just hit me, right? And so... That, we cannot change our perception in that present moment, but we can have the high insight to go, okay, I saw this, this happened, and then go through those feelings of what you feel like. Because if that comes up, that means that there's woundedness inside the the body that needs to be cleared. And then you'll have more space, because when we clear our emotions, we create space in our system for grace to intervene. Then what happens is, then we have the true perception. So when the same setup or account happens, we have more space and we can be, we're more grounded and anchored and we can go, oh, okay, I know that, that was a false perception I had and this is the truth. So, you know, I think that we need to look at those things and not make everything on the outside a reality. We have to go inside and really go, wait a minute, I'm triggered. Probably what's happening on the outside is really not what's going on. It's just my trigger take it back in instead of projecting on the other person and then causing OCD loops and all that other garbage that we've seen out there with all of us doing this as we're learning, you know, how to have higher emotional intelligence. I I just wanted to say, and and let's not set ourselves up for failure by telling ourselves, oh gosh, I'll never be able to do that or oh, that's impossible. Never tell those things to yourself because after a while you'll believe it. Leave it open and and look at it, stay neutral, and, and think, well, you know, is there a possibility? Let me think about this. Sometimes we're too quick and make a sudden answer based on past failures, and that can be enough of uh, unconscious thinking to ruin whatever good you're trying to do. Yes, and right. it should be understood that, you know, what where we're coming from, and the comment I made earlier was not from a sense of elitism, because I, I should have phrased that better, because what happens sometimes, as as Naomi pointed out, is there's a lot of outward projection going on, where when we haven't cleared that space within us, the blockage is there because of unhealed trauma, because of past hurts, etc. And then we respond almost in a vis- visceral fashion, energetically, emotionally, whatever the case may be, and then we project outward, oh, that guy's triggering me, or that gal's triggering me or that news broadcast is triggering me. But really what's happening is it's your inner self saying, well, we still have some work to do. So I I want to make that clear. That was a brilliant point you made, uh, Naomi. This segues into the next topic, that the point Deborah just made. Uh, What was the study with Dr. 
Martin E. P. Seligman, the director of the Penn Positive Psychology, about learned helplessness. Do, do you want to talk about that, Naomi? I'm sure. I think that Deborah did coin in on that too. Um, you know, when I was doing the research on this blog, and I, you know, I'm always looking, 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 and I found this. And on the blog, there is a link, and I would like, you know, if people want to, if it, if it resonates with them, to check this guy out. I mean, it's very interesting what he does with these these dogs. I won't go into that story all that well, but there's a video up, and you can register on his website and get more information because he's he's right on. He he may have the you know a different wording or, or words or whatever, but he's basically saying the same thing we are. And he's basically saying what the the example was that I liked was if you're in school and you're a child and you take a test and you fail the test, you tell yourself, I'm stupid, I'm dumb. Well, then that just is going to anchor into the system. And then that's where this learned helplessness comes in. Now, let's give an example, too. You're a child, you've got support, and you fail the test, and you realize, you know... I didn't study for that test. You know, I know that I can pass that test when I study for it and apply it myself. So there's a possibility there. So just that little tiny, tiny twist in thought can set up a person's whole account for themselves. So the other thing is when we feel helpless, what happens when you, when you look at somebody that, a victim that's with an abusive partner, and they keep going back and you don't know why. Well, this is why. Because their thoughts are telling them they're, they're, they're a failure and they're stupid. And they're stuck in this time loop. And so I wanted to bring this to the attention to not only, if it's happened to any of us, to bring that up, up to the surface. And then also to look at it as, you know, another way of having compassion and understanding for people. Because I have seen this also long in my life where people will do this. They'll go back. You know, my mother was one of them, went back to my dad several times. And people, you know, judging, throwing energy, why would you go back, are you stupid, are you dumb? And all they're doing is reinforcing that instead of going, oh, this is the learned helplessness that's going on. So to me, when I learned this, it really opened up my heart into another intelligence of understanding of how all this setup is. You know, and it's just a setup. And when we're little... We don't understand what we're doing, especially when we don't have the support. So I think that that is what I, what I liked about it, and it's, it's a great study that I think we should all look at to free us from the inner gel cell that we that we're stuck in if we are. Deborah, did you want to comment on that? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Naomi. Sometimes difficult for people because we are our own worst enemy. When we wallow in um, helplessness, it also it, it leads directly to our self-worth. We think we're not worthy. We're not worthy to receive this because we make mistakes and we're infallible. Well, you know what? Everyone is. We are all fallible. We all make mistakes. It's We have to remember we're human beings. We're not perfect. We're not meant to be. When we're able to look at ourselves and take off the rose-colored glasses and understand you know it's okay we're human we've made a mistake we can pick up and move on from this when we can do that and I think that we'll be in a much better place with ourselves I mean I had a problem for a while being a radio announcer I thought what is a grandmother doing with studying aliens and UFOs and all this kind of stuff I don't have any degree in public speaking but you know what I love people I love to hear the stories, and so I took that thought out of my head, and I said, I'm just going to act like I'm on the phone, or I've got somebody sitting on my front porch, and we're just discussing, just make it a one-on-one thing, and so after I did that, I thought, well, you know, people don't think I talk funny, you know, I've got a a southern accent, some people, you know, think that's hilarious, but for the most part, everybody says, hey, I love your accent, that's cool, you know, how nice. Whoever knew that people from Mayberry thought about this stuff. And they connect with me just by me being myself. So I think what Naomi said is very relevant, and it's a, a big key for us uh, finding our right path. That's a key point, because what sometimes people do, 
when they have uh, misgivings about themselves, when they're lacking in self-worth, they they project outwardly in the form of putting on airs, putting on a facade. And being needy. Being needy, being in victim consciousness. There's different ways that people strive to obtain their their psychological needs, have their psychological needs met, whether it's the victim consciousness, whether it's outward projection and big shotting themselves or whatever the case may be. But what happens is that creates a whole other layer, right? And, and it, it itself is a form of learned helplessness. It's a very good point you made about doing something and getting out of your comfort zone, Deborah, because I, I was the same way. You taught me how to do this. You taught me how to do podcasting. And, you know, I stumbled. I fell a lot of times. I made a lot of mistakes. I you know, I was frustrated when I don't get something out perfectly. And then I realized, look, with all this interference and whatnot, sometimes we just got to come out with what we have and just hope that the listeners understand that it's the content of the information that's important, not, you know, whatever little hums or buzzes or interference or toilet flushing you got buzzes it. Are, are in you the got background, it. <laughs> right? And so I had to learn that. And, and learning and succeeding and striving – you cannot separate failure from that equation because the ones who succeed are the ones who keep striving no matter how much they fall down, how many times they fall down. It becomes ingrained that, no, I will not give up. I will not quit. I'm going to move on. This is why Naomi's point about how some women go back to abusive situations is because their self-worth has been chipped down to the nub, and they feel so worthless that only this cad, only this abusive heel uh, would find her worthy or something. And so what we need to do is is just remember that within us, we have this innate connection to Mother Earth. We have this innate connection to Source. Source is not going to spew out junk, right? Which is what basically the humanists are telling us, that, you know, we're basically junk, the transhumanists, rather, uh, we're basically junk, and the only hope we have is that we merge with machines. And also, you, you mentioned the the ET angle, Deborah, about how, well, you had to get out of your comfort zone and talk about things that other people laugh and ridicule. It was very timely and another synchronicity that, I can't remember which friend of mine on Facebook put it out, but it was a, a long quote by uh, one of my mentors, the late Dr. Carla Turner, and she talked about, why so many people insist on the warm and fuzzy New Age Space Brothers outlook on things, despite all the evidence that oh, yes. suggests that some aliens are quite negative and it can induce a lot of physical, psychological harm and trauma. And she said it was an outward projection in so many words, that we want to see the good in people, and by extension, we want to see the good in these aliens, in all of them. But that in itself is a reflection of these these unhealed wounds within us, the the unresolved uh, inner trauma and shame that we haven't slewed off of us and created the space that Naomi talked about. Cognitive dissonance. We we think if we ignore it and we act like, well, everything's fine because they're going to come here and give us all kinds of great uh, tools and heal us and heal our cancer and do all this stuff. If we think like that, then we don't have to worry about what's really going on. And we we can't live like an ostrich with our head buried in the sand because what's going to happen? You're going to come and, and you're going to get eaten by the predator if you're not looking for him. Well, I like to know what's out there. It doesn't frighten me because it's it's life. It's part of life. You know, we have to keep our eyes open and not hide in the sand. I think the, it's a fear trap. You know, the way I see that the, you know, that the, the parasites are using it, it's kind of like we don't want to see this part because it creates too much fear around me. So I only want to look at this part. And as long as I can look at this part, everything is nice and rose colored glasses in my field instead of looking at the fear. And that's denying and de- denial. And that's really denying yourself. Because when you deny yourself, you project out. When you project out, you become an empty vessel. You become an empty vessel. And then they pop in. So, you know, this is the whole game. You know what I mean? This is the game, and this is how they they manage it, and they're good at it. And people that fall prey to it, remember, fall prey, they are in so much unknown fear that they don't even know that it's there. And as long as they have un- un- 
as long as they have that, you know, that mechanism, that fault mechanism that's switched on, then they're not going to see. And I've, and I've seen this and I've got more for, you know, part two on this because this is what I've been doing the last six to nine months in teaching my classes and having all this energy come in my space and seeing the detail and the deception of these uh, parasites, even with very, very, very high intelligent turned on friends that I've been looking at and going, wow, this is even happening to you. And it's just amazing to me that that we all are in this cog on some level and we don't even know it. But the cool part about it is now we do and we're having the show to get this stuff out. Because I know we're all doing our best, and the more, you know, codes, where all we're doing is decoding the system so that we can come back to who we really are. And, you know, and I hope that the people that, you know, the fearful people will, you know, someone will send this show to them so that they can understand that being in fear is really the biggest hijack out there than anything, like you were saying, Deborah. And then fear also sets up the game of, you know, insecurities, addiction, sexual addiction, all that other stuff. So fear is really the, the highway of insulin for them to get in and under our skin and play with us. Well, I think it's relevant today, too, because with the current election, I read yesterday there was a celebrity that almost committed suicide because Trump was elected president. And I thought, are you serious? People, you know, fear Fear from social networks, fear from, you know, TV shows, news station. These things really do wreak havoc on people. And the more you take in, well, I look at it like this. I I use visualization to help me a whole lot. If I feel something that is, you know, fear-based or whatever, I look at it in my mind like this. I look at it as... If you have something that needs electricity, you can't give energy to it unless you plug it in. So I don't plug in fear. If I'm aware that it's fearful, I don't plug it in. I I move on. And that's how you have to look at it. Just don't plug into it. Just leave it alone. Move on. And you'll be a much better off uh, person if you deal with it like that. Uh, Fear stands for false expectations appearing real. Like, for example, the person, the celebrity who threatened suicide, I guess they thought the sky was going to fall and, you know, calamity would ensue because Trump was president. That's that's a fear-based response. Many of the people that cling to the all aliens are our space brothers are here to help us spiritually evolve. The, the inner message is they're, they're shame-based and they feel they're incomplete. They feel they're unworthy and they need the help. They need the help of a savior, be it an alien or, or someone else or something else to help them get to that next level. It's, it's an example of not being embodied. Now, since we're on the subject, Naomi, you mentioned the concept of parasites. Can you tell us what you mean by parasites and give us some personal examples and examples from some of your clients of, of how these parasites can uh, interfere in our lives? Well, for me... I've seen the other energies, but the parasites have been very fascinating because they're like, if you can imagine, this is what they look like, you know, 10,000 flies in the system. So what happens is when they come into my field, it's like this, (laughs) I'm like, whoa, you know, what's going on here, you know, you know, what am I feeling here? And so now what's happened is I'm seeing and feeling the parasite, so I know, wait a minute. Something inorganic is running this person. I have to look at this person, talk to them, even before I let them in my field, because that's part of the targeting. You know, I'll do them, I'll talk to them, and we'll we'll talk, and then I'll see where they're at, where their agendas are at, really what's going on behind the scenes. And then that's where I have to make a decision on where I want to go with these particular people, because um, they have work to do. Not that I don't do a session with them. I do if they pay. But a lot of these people don't want to pay. That's one of the one of the, the red flags. And what I'm seeing is that Mother Earth wants us all to value ourselves deeply. And the way we value ourselves is by seeing ourselves first. And then those that support us and see us too. 
that creates a synergy and that creates a value for all of us. If somebody comes in our field and they don't see us, they don't honor us, they don't respect us, they don't want to pay us, and I don't care about money, I'm talking about barter too, whatever it is, that is when they are, when parasites are running the show. They, they cover them up and what they do is they want to take your juice or your wisdom and copycat it and take it into their ego and then use it for their play. And they will use it for a nugget for enlightenment, which is okay, but what happens is now it's tainted. Now it's not clean because now it's an inorganic energy because they didn't see the creator in myself or the creator in you because they're not seeing the creator within themselves. It has to be an energetic exchange at some level. It has to be a mutually beneficial interaction. What I've noticed in this field also is not only the trolls, because they're just not entities anyway. So many of them are just sock puppets uh, operated by one operator uh, uh, on a computer system. But those people that are essentially negative, and the term they used to use, mean-spirited, and it interesting the quaint phrases people had in the old days folks mean-spirited what's gotten into you uh (laughs) that kind of thing but there's this notion that prevails that says well if you're really a giving person if you really want to help everybody then you need to give all your time and effort and resources for free otherwise you're a fraud otherwise you're just using people you're in it for just the money and that mindset itself comes from this place of, of lack of abundance. It comes from a place of internal impoverishment because there's nothing beneficial about that kind of a mindset. There's no energy exchange that's fair and mutually beneficial. What it is is paraticism. And we see this theme over and over and over again where people in the field and it should be understood, folks, and those of you that, are, that do this kind of a work, you know the kind of spiritual warfare that we are subjected to on occasion, sometimes quite frequently. And so there are attendant risk involved in doing this kind of work, emotionally, physically, financially, you name it. We get hit from all sides at times. And so for someone to come along and say that you have to do this all for free, otherwise it shows how inauthentic you are, Uh, What are your thoughts about that, ladies? When people come into my field, I can see them and I can feel them. And so when when people have agendas, what's what's really hard is, you know, I'll be talking to them and I'll feel I'll start feeling the parasites and the stinging going on in my body. But it's a red flag for me to go, wait a minute, this is out of alignment. You know, where is this going out of integrity? And then I start asking questions. What's going on here? What's what do you really need from here? I needed to be direct. I needed to be honest. What's going on? You know, so that I can get myself back in alignment because what people don't realize when they're not considering the other person and they're going sometimes blindly at an agenda or a wounded child, you know, wounds come up or whatever, they've just opened the door in their system. And since I'm connecting with them, what happens is it comes into my field and that I become a target, and that I spend, I mean, I could spend two weeks clearing the energy out. And, you know, after doing all these years of Apashna, and the, you know, I see so deeply, and I'm understanding more of that, and I'll go into that in another show that I have written up for for another show, but it's basically, I'm going into four different minds, and you go deeper and deeper into these minds, and these different realities, clearing and cleaning them out, and as you clear and clean them out, then you see more. That's what's going on with me, but I didn't understand. So finally, I'm doing some investigation to see what's going on. Why do I see so deeply compared to everybody else? It kind of freaks me out. It's kind of scary. But in the long run, this is where we all need to go because it gives us the inner discernment we need so that we don't get ourselves into trouble. That's our inner guidance, and that brings us back to alignment, and that's what goes down to that absolute heart intelligence again. Well, uh, I know it's very hard doing what Naomi does, and for some strange reason, a couple of years ago uh, when I met Naomi and uh, a few things started popping up with me that I didn't normally do, uh, like you call them premonitions or different things like that, and 
it was a very, very odd thing. I had to fight with myself to first believe the premonitions that I got, but I couldn't always understand exactly when I met someone or became involved in conversation with someone about uh, a show or information, I would notice that things that they said just really didn't resonate with me, and I got sort of some bad vibes and stuff from them. Well, because of Naomi, when she says that we all need to do this, she hit the nail on the head. We can all do this if we will look really look with our eyes open at the truth and try to understand that, you know, we're not made to be perfect. We need to trust our instincts more. We need to look in the world around us for examples that the universe gives us uh, for discernment. And when you can tap into that, oh my gosh, I mean, it's wonderful. But on the other hand, when you... Like she said, when you go into someone's field and they're deceptive and they're not what they say they are, it's chaos and it can cause a lot of sleepless nights for you. You have to learn how to discern what you're seeing. And thanks to her, she has, she has saved me so much time and heartache and headache. And if she can teach somebody like me, I mean, I'm 61 years old. I'm 61 years old. And these steps that she's talking about, if if you can implement them in your life, it, it will help. But even so, I just want you to know, it's not it's not easy. You have to pay attention to what you're doing. And what happened to Naomi, it could happen to me. You know, but thank goodness... I have the benefit of Naomi's experience, and I listen to what she says, and I find out that, you know, I don't have to go through that because I trust her judgment. We really do have sort of a connection with each other, just as I have with you, James. We all seem to have a connection here, and I think it's because we're all on the vibrational frequency with each other, and that doesn't mean we're perfect. That doesn't mean that we'll always do the right thing. But what it means is that we have our eyes open. I trust what Naomi says. I I can feel in my body when she tells me things. It resonates with truth. And just as I'm sure that you do, James, have you ever met someone and they just, well, I know you said right when you met Naomi, you knew, you could tell. But there's a lot of people that we meet like that. But also, there are people who come in on false light who are deceptive and are able at being neutral for a little bit. And then things come in that it's just like she said, the swarming flies. You think, oh, my God, how did that happen? Oh, my God, this is a bunch of BS. This person wasn't like that when I first met them. How did they turn into this? And it's like a nightmare. So all of, all of these steps that Naomi is talking about is very important and but just also know too that Naomi, myself, you, we're all, we're, we're all human. We're all human. We make mistakes. But with these tools, with these tools, implementing these tools, I tell you what, it sure does save you a whole lot of time. I, I don't like to be depressed and upset or have my mind in chaos. I mean, do you guys, I, I like being able to move on and go to better things. I would like to put something into the circle as far as a little bit of energy management and have an understanding how some of this stuff works because it can be so complicated and so confusing sometimes too when we're speaking. You know, in the body, you can just feel it. It's really hard to express it verbally or express it on paper. It it can be a challenge sometimes. But I think that for me, the reason why I call it embody energetic ecstasy is that is our true nature. You know, no one's going to give me ecstasy but myself. And so when we embody, we're always in our, we're always in every cell of our body. That's what gives us discernment. So in no way do I ever go out into anybody's field or project out or violate their field because that is another parasitic game that will cause a lot of karmic problems. And what happens is I believe the, I know, it's not believe, 
I know the inner discernment, again, going back to the absolute, is filling it in my body, and that is what gives me the, the discernment going on. You know, so I can feel, I mean, you know, anything from this, the finest tune to sexual energy, knowing that's a manipulation point, but that's how, that's how checking an energy, energy signature works. And when you get so fine tuned, you really, really can see who the manipulators are out there. And it's very, very fascinating, but it's good because we need to know that moving through this because there's so many people at this point in time, you know, carbon copying other people using their tools or whatever, and they're pretending like they're energy workers or whatever, and it's turning into, you know, kind of a, a kind of a really disarray monster out there, and it's heartbreaking. But the cool part about it, again, because I always come from the highest view, sometimes we have to go through that experience to see. I mean, I had to go through a few experiences myself to understand and see the truth and, and understanding of how this energy works, the high insight and learning so that we can all learn from each other, and I know that that's what this show is about, and going forward into the second show, I probably have about 10 more examples of this last, you know, year of what I've noted for people to learn, and they're very sly, and they're very sneaky, and I, you know, I try to keep up on some of the the updated videos, because I hate people to waste their time and hear, you know, hear stuff over and over again. And this stuff, I believe, I haven't heard out there yet, so I hope you all stay tuned for the second hour. Deborah, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, just briefly, I'd like to say this. These tools that Naomi is talking about, it's not its not a place where she just says, well, this person, it's all them, it's all them. It, we always have a part somehow in these things. Like I found out from her, well, I already knew that I, I'm a caretaker. I love to help people. I love to do things if I see someone is needing something like they don't uh, understand how to promote or they, they don't understand how to get to this point or do that. I'm, I'm there willing to help them. But also, I have to remember when to shut the door to my caretaker needs, if you might say. I met uh, someone online. Um, it was a female. And at first, she seemed okay. You know, she seemed all right. She's very intelligent and smart. And uh, she friended Naomi, and Naomi only said one thing. She said, yes, I met her, but I found her to be very needy. And, and oh, my gosh, how true that was. Not only did this person turn out to be needy, it was the worst, worst neediness I had ever experienced. It turned into a snowball from hell. It turned into a huge monster. And just totally out of control in a short amount of of time, these entities that were in her were wanted to destroy, wanted to destroy what I had because that's what they wanted. They wanted to be able to do that. They wanted a radio show. They wanted to be able to um, do research and do a lot of the things. So, in fact, she was sort of trying to piggyback on, on what I had. So when I learned that lesson from Naomi, I tell you what, I have been so much happier. So I hope everybody does tune in for the second half because if it made my life easier, then it's going to help a lot of people out there. Naomi, can you let the people know where they can find your work, where they can find your website, and how they can contact you? I'm sure, James. You can get a hold of me on Facebook under Naomi Swan with an E, N-A-O-M-E. Or my um, website is embodyenergeticecstasy.com. And Deborah, can you let our listeners know how they can find you online and how they can find your information? Uh, yes, sure. You can go on Facebook, and I am Deborah Jane East. I also have Starlight Seventeen Radio Show, which is on Facebook, and. Um, Another show I do is Notes from the Underground, which is also on Facebook. But my website is notesfromtheunderground.blogspot.com, and you can reach all of my information there as well. We've reached the end of the first hour. We're just getting started with our very special guests, Naomi Swan and Deborah Jane East. If you like what we do, if you believe in what we do here at the Cosmic Switchboard, please go to our website, thecosmicswitchboard.com, sign up and become a member. And we'll see you at the top of the next hour.